why is it that you can go to very different places in the world and find very similar collections of species? You can go to a place in Asia, North America, South America, and find you know, pine forests with foxes and butterflies and specific types of birds. And yet, when you actually look very carefully, you realize, oh, that bird might be similar to the bird in the other continent, but it's actually a different species. Same types of organisms together, but different species. What is the source of speciation? Now, of course, Darwin thought he had an answer for that, but there's another person, a contemporary of Charles Darwin, who wrote completely contradictory laws of genetics. Yes, Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk who was a brilliant scientist, totally contradicted Darwin. Hey, I'm Dr. Rob. I am coming to you today from the Carolina Sandhills National Wildlife Monument. I'm in the middle of South Carolina. This is the coastal plain where there are lots of pine trees and there's lots of birds and ticks and chiggers. And this is very similar to the area that I grew up in in New York, which is a thousand miles from here, except we didn't have chiggers. Now we do, but we didn't then when I was growing up anyway. It's a very similar sandy soil, scrubby oaks and pine tree sort of an environment. But why these species? Why are they different today than they were in the fossil record? And why are the species in one place different than the species in another place? What is the source of that biological information? Well, enter a new series of paper by Crompton, Sprague, Truman, and Juncker. These are uh, scientists in Europe. They're associated with the Wharton Wussen Group, which is a creationist group in Germany. I'm going to get to meet them in April. I can't wait. But they're writing in the American creationist journals. This is very good because we need more uh, cross-pollination amongst the groups. And they're writing about something that's near and dear to my heart. The origin of species. The idea that species change over time. In fact, I've done four episodes on this show called Species Were Designed to Change. And a three-part series on uh, creation.com, Species Were Designed to Change. And I'm trying to outline all the various ways that God would have created things to adapt and change over time. That's stealing a lot of thunder from the evolutionists. In fact, it's like, well, everything Darwin ever wrote and every, anything most evolutionists wrote, wrote since then, it's actually creationist arguments, interestingly. But this new paper series, Mendelian Speciation, part one, two, three, and four. Part one, what is the abundant source of significant biodiversity? Boom, great question. Part two, latent genetic information, which is something I've talked about. Hidden information that can appear later. Part three, fixation and reproductive isolation. Yes, fixation, isolation. Those are things that lead to speciation. And part four, adaptive radiations and something they call cis evolution, which some people might call microevolution, but it's really um, speciation from within a created kind. Now, I'm not going to use that word evolution. In fact, that's on our arguments. We think a creation should not use page, the idea of microevolution, because it's, the evolutionists don't have a dif dis distinction between micro and macro. I mean, Darwin said, look at this little change. Now, let me extrapolate for millions of years. Look at all the changes that can happen. So their micro actually bleeds into macro. There's no easy line there. So I don't go there in this cis-evolution speciation versus trans-evolution, which is evolution writ large. Um, I'm not going to major on that. In fact, I'm, I don't know if I'll ever get to talking about this on the show because I want to talk about their first paper. The first paper in the series to me was the most exciting, the most interesting. They brought up ideas that I never thought of and they took ideas that I've thought about or even written about and like put it on steroids and made it even bigger. Like, wow, I never even thought where this could go. Some fascinating things. They're talking about uh, Darwin's laws of genetics. That is the law of segregation um, that alleles for a trait, like, you know, purple pea uh, flower versus white pea flowers. They will be inherited separately. That's the law of segregation, but also the law of independent assortment, which is that alleles for different genes, like maybe purple and white flowers, over here we have green and yellow seeds. They're inherited separately. So you have assortment of each one, and it's random four things that aren't linked together. Now, uh, Mendel, when he's working with his pea seeds in his monastery garden, happened to choose different traits that are actually on different chromosomes. Now, was that just blind 
luck or was that by design? Did he have prior information? How long had that monastery been experimenting on those peas? I just wonder what kind of information he had. Why did he choose those things? I'm not sure. This is something I just want to know and I've never had the time or taken the time to dig deeply into what's the background behind Mendel's experiments. Hey, uh, you uh, creationists, you um, uh, fans of history, fans of science history, that would be a fascinating thing to explore. Just putting that out there for you. But Mendel's working in this monastery on his peas, and he develops these laws, but his papers, now this is what Crompton et al. pointed out, which I didn't realize. His papers were not talking about the laws of genetics so much as talking about the, now that we have these laws of genetics, we can explain speciation. Oh, so Mendel was directly writing about the origin of species, and his papers came out just a couple of years after the origin of species that Darwin wrote was published. Oh, there's something I want to track down that I know, I think I read it, I might have heard a lecture, I don't remember anymore. It was at least 10 years ago. But the person was making the claim that point for point in Mendel's papers, he's paralleling the sections of origin of species. Therefore, he was arguing against origin of species. That's, again, something I need to track down. If you know where that comes from, send me a note because I would love to learn that again. And, and in fact, if I can learn that, I will do an episode just on that thought. But Mendel arguing against Darwin. But Crompton et al., they talk about Mendel's law of exponential trait combinations and how that law explains the origin of species. And it works like this. If you have a trait, let's say, um, you know, purple or white flowers in pea plants, well, those um, genes are going to be inherited randomly by offspring. But a lot of the offspring are going to be what's called homozygous. That is, they'll have two copies of the purple or two copies of the white. Okay. But if you allow them to breed over time, you get more and more and more homozygous individuals and fewer and fewer what are called heterozygous individuals, especially when you consider that um, groups of organisms, they tend to split. Like maybe there's peas and it's growing on a mountain and the, the pea plants are spreading out in a valley somewhere. Well, eventually you'll get isolation and you have a, a small group of peas that started growing in one place and they'll reproduce only within themselves. And then maybe that group there, maybe it's only founded by a couple of pea seeds because a bird pooped a pea seed or something off a branch and it landed in a forest and started growing pea plants. And well, that group isn't going to have all the genetic information of the entire species. So they've lost genetic information. And over time, they'll lose even more genetic information. And you'll get a group of plants in this case that look different than the parent species. So just the normal process of sexual reproduction leads to a loss of heterozygosity. It leads to fixation of specific alleles. So all the plants now have purple flowers, or all the plants now have white flowers. But if you add enough traits in there, you're going to start affecting maybe germination time. You might affect um, growth habitat. You might affect uh, uh, when the flowers appear, morning versus evening, long or short flowering times. And that can lead to reproductive isolation. If you have enough traits that are varying within a, within a parent species and you're getting fixation of these traits in different groups of organisms, you can get differences and they start breeding true to type. And that is a definition of a species, something that breeds true to type because the variation has been lost. In fact, if you had just 10 different genes and these genes had, you know, two characters per gene, you know, white or purple, green or yellow, smooth or wrinkled, tall or short, morning flowering, evening flowering, you know, pick, pick something, it doesn't matter. But if you just had 10, you can get 1,000 different homozygous phenotypes. That is, 1,000 different potential species. Now, you're probably not going to get 1,000 different species, but you might get 10. And each one of those is going to have a random collection of fixed genes. So you can tell they came from parent species, but each one of them is different. Picture animals spreading out on the earth after Noah's flood. They're going to become isolated from one another. And 
because of Mendel's law of exponential trait combinations, you're going to get fixation of specific alleles in one population and different alleles in another population. Therefore, you can have brown bears and black bears, sun bears, polar bears. If you had 20 different genes, with each gene having two alternate variants that affects the way a species looks or acts, you can have a million potential species, a million different combinations just from 20 genes of different homozygous phenotypes. Wow. Well, if, if God just programmed into the initial creation a little bit of genetic diversity and just a few genes, we can explain the rise of species easily. Bears, cats, trees, different types of trees, different types of butterflies. You're going to expect species to naturally arise by default in a biblical framework. So Darwin's origin of species. Um, sorry, Darwin, we can explain the origin of species. So instead, Darwinism has to explain the origin of life. Now, we can explain the origin of life that as the creationists can because we have an all-powerful genius creator God who is outside of space and time and who takes his mind and he organizes matter in such a way to create living things. We have a reasonable cause for living things. They have nothing but blind chance. And they have to believe in much bigger miracles than me because they need the most absolutely possible, improbable set of circumstances to arise, not only produce the chemicals that life requires, not only to produce the cells that life requires, but to produce the information strings that DNA carries that is necessary for living things to exist. So the burden of proof then is on the Darwinist to explain where life came from, not where species came from. They think they can explain it, we can definitely explain it, but it's all part of God's creative genius. Something else that Crompton et al. pointed out is that the loss of heterozygosity is fast, very fast. Given a gene pool with lots of genetic diversity, you very quickly arrive at a whole bunch of individuals that are homozygous, and you get fewer and fewer heterozygous individuals in the population over time. So speciation can be very rapid. Therefore, if you have groups of organisms spreading out on Earth after the flood, species will naturally arise in that situation. To me, these sorts of things are unendingly interesting. I love contemplating what God created and what would have happened to his creation over time. The rise of species is centerpiece of creationist thought. It has been for a long time. It is not in any way, shape, or form a proof of evolution. It's what we would expect to happen given God creating life a few thousand years ago. But I've got a jet. I'm actually in between events. I spoke at a church this morning. I had maybe an hour of time just to relax in between. So I decided to turn on my camera and film this. It's not very relaxing, but it's my downtime. And from here, I got another half an hour drive to my evening church and it's getting late. So I got to go. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for so much for your time. Thank you so much for listening. If you want more, please go to creation.com and look up my articles. You can find uh, this paper by Crompton et al. On the, uh, in the Journal of Creation section of creation.com. But I'm not sure if it's out of the paywall yet. I think there's a one-year moratorium on general creation articles. So if you want to read the article, sign up for the Journal of Creation. There'll be a link in the show notes also. Thank you all to my supporters. I really appreciate it. You guys are wonderful. Just seeing my support base grow over time is so encouraging. I mean, massively encouraging. And I am keep, I'm going to keep on doing these videos and this podcast because of you. Because a lot of you have encouraged me and said, please make more. So I will. Have a wonderful day. Remember, God is the creator.